we have a case of transradial approach for right renal angio angioplasty and stenting. Next slide. Our case is a 78-year-old female with hypertension diagnosed in her 40s, and over that time, it's been poorly controlled despite four medications you see there. She's on diltiazem, sotalol, clonidine, and an ACE inhibitor. And she has uh, renal insufficiency, creatinine as high as 3.4. Her other history includes hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, diabetes, and a history of gallstone pancreatitis. And her surgical history is as listed there. Next slide. Uh, there are her medications. Next slide. So and in this patient, we see her creatinine is uh, always kind of elevated, most recently 1.34. And on non-invasive imaging, she had elevated velocities in the right renal artery. You can see there 354 and in the left 275. Um, so given these findings, we're, uh, next slide. We have a 78-year-old female with likely renovascular hypertension given the, the four medications and difficult to control. So her options uh, included continuing medical management, open repair, or endovascular repair. Okay, so I just want to show you the uh, setup we have now, and we can, you know, talk about renal artery uh, interventions in general if, if the audience and the panel thinks that's, that's a good idea. But right now, in the patient's left wrist, we have a, a six French slender sheath here. Uh, and again, that's probably the largest sheath that uh, I put in to do these uh, cases. I think that the slender sheath in general has been a phenomenal ad advance, and it's, it's really our, our, our go-to sheath for uh, peripheral vascular interventional uh, cases from a radial um, approach. I want to show you some of the work that we've done so far. So if we could just cycle some of the, some of the images here. So this is the, uh, the guide cath going up. Uh, th again, through the uh, slender sheath. If we could just get a zoom in here on the tip of the, there you go, okay? So again, very nice gentle curve to abut the back wall of the aorta and it points perpendicular off uh, and it can point uh, a caudal also. So it'll engage into the visceral vessels or into the renal vessels. So that's what we have in the patient right now. So we, we switched out for a four French directional catheter to navigate down the descending aorta. You can see we were able to reduce the loop there. Next uh, image, please. And then the, the, the floppy wire is going down the descending aorta, and we're able to advance the six French guide down to the descending aorta. Next, please. Here's our diagnostic angiogram, and uh, it matches up to the uh, backup, backup one image, uh, please. Matches up to the ultrasound very, very closely. Uh, but you know, by, by my interpretation, the left renal artery is in fact occluded. And the right renal artery appears to me to have a, a very significant high-grade narrowing with some post-tenotic dilatation at the uh, ostium. Uh, and so what we did here was a, a sort of standard no-touch technique. Uh, we advanced the guide, uh, again, with, with the angle to uh, right at the level of the right renal artery ostium. Next image, please. And here we're doing a uh, selective injection. And you can see there the, a very tight narrowing, back one please, thank you, uh, of it. And we've reduced the, uh, the floppy tip on the 035 wire to allow more curve to be generated in the guide. Next image please. And then here's the, uh, the coronary wire. This is a stabilizer wire being advanced across. This, this way, it's sort of classic no-touch technique. We're, we're, we're avoiding scraping against the aorta with the guide. The guide's floating in, in the aorta, and we're able to navigate the coronary wire across. Next image, please. And uh, again, uh, at this point, we're then able to remove the 035 wire and engage the renal artery with the guide. This is a, a pressure wire, a prime wire, which is uh, commercially distributed by uh, Volcano. Uh, just to get a translational gradient. And uh, I think if you, if you see the image here, I'll, I'll actually put it on live uh, just to show you, but I was able to measure the gradient while we were off camera. Um, this is the, the live uh, tracing. And you can see there's a significant dampening of the yellow curve, which is the pressure wire inside the, uh, the uh, a kidney. And what we uh, were able to do was when we actually measured it, we were able to demonstrate there's about an 80 millimeter gradient across this lesion. Um, and again, you can see that the peak is off the screen on the, uh, uh, on the aortic pressure. That's the red uh, bar. 
Uh, and again, here you're almost approaching the difference between the top uh, number here and the, and the bottom number, 100 millimeter gradient, 80 millimeter gradient. So certainly a hemodynamically significant lesion for cuff pressure shows about a 160 systolic pressure, whereas the aortic pressure off the guide cath is showing a 200. So um, if I had to speculate, she probably has a hemodynamically significant left subclavian lesion. She's, she's clinically asymptomatic aside from the dampening of, of the blood pressure, but there's probably at least a 60% narrowing of this left subclavian where we are, and uh, that's causing a, a, a dampening of the, uh, of the blood pressure. What I, what I did when I recognized this was I switched out for a four French directional catheter with a, a, a curve on it, uh, that was able to go right through the, uh, the ostium, uh, engage the aortic arch, torque that to face the descending aorta, and, and we were able to get a, fl a floppy tip wire to go down. So it was very straightforward in order to, 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 to do it. I think the important thing is to recognize that you can, you can, you, you can hit a, a, a left subclavian lesion much uh, the same way that uh, in patients with peripheral vascular disease, you can hit an iliac lesion going up to do an abdominal uh, intervention. You need to be ready for it, and you need to uh, plan for it and have a, a whole system set up in order to navigate through it. So to that study, right? I, com I completely <laughs> agree with you. Uh, you know, we, we, had, we had a nice conversation uh, in the office with the, the patient and the patient's family about what the clinical equipoise is for doing renal interventions. And, you know, I, I wish we had better data for this procedure. But again, this is the kind of case where I think if you have global ischemia to the organ and you perform a proper revascularization, you're probably going to get a very good clinical uh, result here. So I'm just going to center on the stent just so we can really see what we're doing. Uh, you can see my stent's positioning distally. So what stent uh, did you choose? This is a, uh, a Herculink Elite stent. It's the same stent I, I used on the, on the previous case. I think it's really excellent for this clinical application here. So I, I, I think that in, in general, when you're dealing with renal and visceral I intervention, you, I think you have more pushability coming from above. Uh, before we adopted radial access here, I was a big believer in, in, in brachial access for high-grade lesions and for uh, CTOs. I, I think if you have the right shape guide and you get a lot of back wall support, you can use uh, specialty CTO coronary wires to get through uh, CTOs. Uh, we didn't have to do that in this case. We used a, a very, very you know, fine navigation tip wire to, in order to navigate this high-grade lesion, and we were able to cross it without too much, of, um, uh, too much work, basically. But I, in, 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 so so I'm just going to do an angiogram here just to make sure that everyone agrees we're in the right position. How did you uh, size your stent? Did you measure out the CT? You just eyeballed it, the uh, IVUS? So, uh, you know, again, a good, a good, good question here. So, you know, do you measure it for the post uh region, or do you measure it for the normal artery? You know, and this is a, this, is, this isn't a, uh, you know, young uh, patient, uh, and so. You know, the, the, the question is, how much do you oversize it? How much do you undersize it? Uh, I, you know, I'm curious to what, what diameter you would have chosen. I, I, I chose not to do IVIS. I'm not sure it would have added anything here. Let's do another angiogram, please. I think all of us do uh, rigorous measurements based off of uh, cross-sectional and angio, and then put in a six <laughs> by 24. <laughs> Really, I so I a chose a six by 15, and I think I just jumped forward a little bit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back a touch. I, I felt that I was a little bit too much into the aorta before. I like the, I think I'm gonna like this a lot. So I'm gonna eject again. You know, Rob, I mean, if you're- choosing... Again, the tremendous benefits of having a really robust guiding system uh, engaged here to be able to visualize this in, in real time. We're using quarter strength contrast here. Yeah, I like this. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. All right. We're up to 14, please. It's the moment of truth. truth. Yeah, exactly. That looks like we nailed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very nice. Take it down, please. Nice uh, waist. Can we recycle the blood pressure cuff, please? So from, from here, uh, what's the plan next, Rob? Do you get uh, pressure measurements? Do you do another angio? I think we're gonna do another angiogram. Okay. 
And what about the, the left side? Are you planning to try to recant? I'm planning on not going after the left side today for a number of different reasons. I think this is a chronic occlusion. I want to see if the patient improves clinically after doing this revascularization. Uh, and uh, I, I think if it, if it needs to be done, we can stage it for another day. I think that's a whole other uh, resource allocation to try and do a renal artery occlusion. And uh, it's something we really didn't discuss in detail about going after today. I think if it, was a, if, it, if it was a pinhole narrowing of the artery, we would consider it. But with a complete occlusion, it's probably been down for quite some time. I, I, I'm, I'm uh, not as you know, uh, enthusiastic about it. Uh, Plavix for at least 30 days if she can tolerate it. Uh, ideally, probably 90 days. Uh, and then aspirin afterwards. Okay. I think that looks like an excellent angiographic result. I think we're going to do a DSA here, and then we're going to be finished. Typically, heparinize these patients, you know, during the procedure, whether you do it from the groin or from the wrist. So, you know, you gave 3,000 of heparin, you know, during the puncture. How do you dose your, your heparin for this? Uh, so we gave 3,000 through the access. I gave another 2,000 as soon as we got into the, uh, into the artery. I wanted a, a therapeutic ACT here. Honestly, everything went so rapidly, I didn't even have time to draw an ACT. We're probably going to draw an ACT now before we take the sheath out of the wrist. Yeah. Uh, but I, in, a, in an ideal world, uh, we didn't even talk about distal embolic pr protection, which I'm not sure would have worked here because there's not enough of a landing zone to really seed it. But if you're using dyslobot protection, you want an ACT greater than uh, 300, certainly, for a, a uh, yeah. procedure like this. So uh, I, I, I err on the side of more heparin as compared to less heparin. Uh, I think this is a great angiographic yeah, uh, result. I, I think we're, 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 we're done here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the, the equipment out, and then we're going to draw an ACT, and... Uh, and we're going to uh, put on the band, assuming the ACT is at a reasonable level. So, you know, again, we have groin. Yeah, I, I think if the ACT is, you know, around 250 or less, I think it's totally fine. I don't really have any problems with it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't want the ACT greater than 300. I don't want the patient to wear a band for multiple, multiple, multiple hours. Um, I think PAD patients are just slightly different cohort. We haven't fully established the safety in fully therapeutic uh, anticoagulation yet. I think it's certainly worth a lot of research to try and uh, figure out uh, how safe it is with you know, full therapeutic anticoagulation. But uh, I, like I said, 250 on ACT, I think it's pretty good to put a band on. So just out of curiosity, your total floor, yeah, so there it is, okay. So your total floor time for renal artery stent, including navigation, was about 